Will. Welcome back at the Fearless Future podcast. We're your hosts, Glenn Schwarm. And Amber Schwarm. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about some Gen X stuff to get, to get us started here today. And then we're going to have some business conversation talking about investing for beginners and why people are always you know, searching on the MLS and can't find anything and what to do about that. So we'll have a little mix of stuff there. So Good times. Let's uh, do a little Gen X moment here. And I'm going to play you a song. Uh, I'm going to play you a sound, a Gen X sound. All you guys who are Gen Xers out there listening right now, Ask yourself if this sound rings a bell to you. And if it doesn't, you're not a Gen Xer. <laughs> How about that? What is it? <laughs> Who's the artist? Uh, I know it. I can't think of his name. Uh, is it? You're going to say uh, it. Peter, yep. Peter Gabriel. Peter Gabriel. Very good. So here's a question. What's the name of the song? I don't know. Sledgehammer. Oh, that's Sledgehammer, yeah. Do you remember the video? They had like clay and the guy was hitting himself in the head and the clay legs were coming out. This is back when like animation was just starting and I all don't, that. You don't I remember don't that remember video? video? No. Oh, it was great. It was crazy. So here's another big, here's a test for you for Gen X. Since we're both Gen Xers, but I'm a little older you're, Gen you're, X. You're earlier Gen X than me. You're five years older than so me. So Gen X is what? So it's night born from 65, 65 to, 80. to 80. And I was born 69. And I was 73. Right. So I'm a little older in the Gen X yeah. cycle. But here's a question. What band from the 80s was Peter Gabriel from? All listeners out I there. I know I should know this. I love, love you to put a comment if you know what this is. So yeah. I don't remember. I know I should know that though. As I'll soon give, as you're saying it, I'm I'll give you mad. a hint. It's a book in the Bible. Come on. Genesis. There you go. Genesis. There you go. The first, I was going to say the first book, but that seemed like that was getting really <laughs> that was easy. Too easy of a yeah. It's the first book in the Bible that begins with a G and an E and an N. And okay. All right. Well, good. Well, I like to in a little Gen X moment, just kind of bring us all back to, uh, to uh, I don't know, just our old, our old times. It was a great, great generation we raised in. It for was. Me. It no, was I a great it. generation. I actually saw something this morning. I, I Googled something about uh, our generation. And let me see if I can find that really quick. It talked about what an amazing generation that we were in. And it talked about things like stuff that came out of that were computers. Like we had no computer. Think of all. No, we didn't grow computers up with computers. started back yeah. from Gen Xers. That's when it started. Yeah. I was probably, boy, I was in high school and I got my first computer. It was a Texas Instrument computer. Yeah. And oh, TI was big because I'm from Texas. So that was big. You know, as dumb as it sounds, I didn't tie that together. Texas Instrument, yeah. Texas. I just thought of Texas. I didn't, that was just the name I thought about. And so mine, uh, at Christmas time, I got one with a speech synthesizer so it could talk. Isn't that funny? That was back yeah. in the 80s. Now, I could never, I knew how to make it say a couple words. Of course, I tried to make it cuss. Because I was a kid trying to figure did. it out. So, but my buddy Bob also did. You got also one. try to get it to look up naked girls. No, that was not. <laughs> that wasn't a thing back in. The, that was not a thing back in the, then. The internet was not a thing, so I you had know, no idea. So when I was thirteen, so what year was that? So that was um, eighty six. Eighty six. Uh, I started working full time for my mom and dad's company, and talking about computers, they were enormous. Like my dad had, it was a rubber stamp company, so it was called a typesetter. And the thing was as big as this desk. And then it had a big monitor on it and a keyboard. And, and it had these, this wheel in it that you had to put the film for the different fonts that you were using. So like, think about how- Was that a computer or just a mechanical device? Both. Or, it was okay. like a computer and a, kind of a, it was called a typesetter. Okay. So, so you would type in the keyboard, you know, and it showed up on the monitor what you wanted. And then this wheel that was over on the side would, would spin and it would put the font that you- put the command in for, yeah. it would like print that on paper. How do they do it now? Do you know? Now it's just done like in a graphics program. Like, like once things, on a, a a, yeah, we used to do it on Corel Draw or people could do it like on, um, uh, in Adobe. So you would just like do it like that and just lay so, it out. But, but now even, even more advanced is they're probably doing it by laser. So that device is probably obsolete. Oh, it's totally obsolete. But, but like, that's what I started on. It was a dinosaur, like the size of it and the. <laughs> but think about think about the eighties. Think about that. That was a big part of that generation. And, right? and the now 80s. we hold computers in our hands with our cell phones. Most of us that were born in sixty five to eighty were raised in the eighties and early nineties. That was kind of our raise. So in the eighties and in that generation, computers started, and then look what they've evolved to. Right. Things like the types there. Look what that evolved to. Right. The first video games came out. The Commodore sixty four. Yeah. Like that was a the, that was a game or a computer 
That was a computer, I think, but there's also Atari. Atari, yeah. I yes. just saw an old ad. I started, I follow a lot of Genex things. I loved things. Atari. Yeah, that came out. And I, there was $129 back then, which was, there was a lot of money back then. There was a lot of then. money back then. And so I remember having that. Have, my buddy had that. We used to play Pong and back and forth. So it's good good times thinking about Genex. But th that's where a lot of things started, like video games, mm -hmm. computers, and look where they are today. Right. I mean, everything started in that generation. So it's so the Ataris uh, only worked in your house, and now our kids play Roblox and Minecraft with other kids all over the country, all, all over, over the, the place. Country. They do, yeah. So, all right, so let's let's move along and talking about Gen X references. We talk about that a lot because obviously we are Gen X references. So I want to talk about the MLS for a minute because I think people, you know, people talk about like investing for beginners and you know what to do if you're still stuck on the MLS looking for deals. When I do you remember? Back in the 80s and 90s, if you wanted to look for a piece of property on the MLS or the multiple listing service, you called an agent. They gave you a book that printed either weekly or monthly. I forgot. It looked like it had the font size of like a phone book. And it had all, do you remember that? I don't. Really? I remember being in the grocery store and seeing like a magazine, like at the, where the grocery no. carts were, there were like magazines that had houses in them, but I don't remember a book. No, very different. The MLS book was very hard to read. It had pictures. I believe it was only black and white, very small, but it had all the tax information and everything you see now on a Zillow listing, but you had to look it up on a piece of paper. I mean, that makes sense. I just don't remember. And obviously things would change printing to printing. So sometimes by the time you called, it was sold, it was yeah. pending or, or whatever it might be. So I remember that. That's that's what the MLS used to be. Some of you guys might remember that. I mean, th those were the days where people would drive around neighborhoods and look for signs in the yard for houses for sale too. Like that was that was very popular. You think so? Well, yeah. In the eighties and nineties. Oh yeah, for sure. Look for a, a a real estate sign. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I thought you meant like a for sale by owner. There might there may have been some from from Fizbo's. Fizbo is for sale by owner. In case you guys are wondering, but I think that we should talk about kind of how we got started because we used to. Back when we first started flipping houses, you could buy deals on the MLS and those aren't nearly as prevalent today, right? right? No. So there, because now there's so much more, much more competition, but competition. we got started, we used our mail carrier. Right. We told this story uh, several times, but our mail carrier, we let her know that we were, we were looking for houses. If you know any houses, let us know. And so she found the house that was two blocks from where I lived and said, hey, there's a house for sales. There's an older couple working on the, remember this? Yeah. There's an old couple working on the kitchen right now. It's hot. I forgot what time of they year it miserable. was. It was summer, end of summer, I yeah. think. End of summer in 07, I yeah. think it was. And I actually jogged to the house. I ran up there and I walked in and asked if they wanted to sell their house. And they said, yes. They said, yes. And so we ended up buying the house. It was the very first flip we ever did. Yep. On Stooley Place, Place in Rotterdam. And that was how we... Um, found our first deal. And then shortly thereafter, as we started getting a rhythm, remember 2008, there were a lot of listings on the MLS because there weren't as many people investing because the world was saying how bad real estate right. investing was. Because the real estate crisis was going on. Yeah. All and the fraudulent lending and all that stuff. We didn't listen to all that, all the naysayers online, or not online, but on just telling us that real estate was bad. In our life. <laughs> yeah, in our life. We just kept going forward with it. But things were really different back then. We, we used to work with, remember all the relations, relations we used to have with the REO agents? Yeah. So let me clarify what REO means. An REO is, stands for real estate owned. And every bank has a real estate or an REO agent or an REO department that usually hires an agent that represents them. So the REO department that says real estate owned, banks don't want to own real estate. Banks want to get rid of real estate. So they have a process by which they will list those houses on the MLS. As hard as I tried, I could never buy direct from the bank. Remember, yeah. I, remember I talked, oh, to, we couple, tried. talked to some bank presidents. Yeah. I have a friend who had a friend who was a bank president. They said, it's just not the process. We can't do it that There's way. There's a lot of red tape. A lot of red tape because they have to go through certain things for the, if they're FHA loans and a lot of different regulations for that. Be that as it may, we used to be able to get phone calls from, from the, the agents, agents. The REO agents. There's a woman, I can't think what her name is right now. She was, she did, we bought a lot yeah. of houses for back to in the day. or something one time. Yes. I can't think what her name is right now, but I, she used to call me and say, the closest thing I had to a pocket listing, and a pocket listing is when an agent gets a listing and they essentially put it in their pocket before they put it on the MLS officially and call a few people or call somebody like us and say, hey, I have a listing. Do you want to buy it before it goes live? Right. And that used to be a thing. Nowadays, I don't know if they do it as much, uh, but what, they, what the bank used to, because now it's so hot on the so, MLS. So 
real estate agents like to do that because then they got both sides of the deal too. We should explain that. That's true. Like, like why would an agent do that? Explain it's because, it. because usually there's a seller's agent and a buyer's agent. And then they split the commission, whether that's 6% or 7% or whatever it is. Correct. You know, one agent would get 2.5% and the other agent would get like 3.5. So if, if somebody has a pocket listing, they might not be driving the price up as much by getting multiple offers. But if that agent gets both sides of the commission, that's still advantageous to them. That's why it was a win-win for the agent and the person that they were selling it to. That was a good point, honey. You did great with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just love your little snooty comments today. I feel them coming. Oh man, I feel like I'm going to be a, I'm going to get an Uber home today. It's going to be easier for me, probably safer. The REO agents, what, what they used to do, because they couldn't really give a pocket listing because it was a bank. The bank said, no, we have to have it on the MLS. But if you remember, I can't think what her name is, but she, L Lorraine? Is that Lorraine? She was one, but there was a different one. I can't think. I, no, anyways, name doesn't matter. She would call me the minute the bank called her and said, hey, I have a house on so-and-so street, whatever. She would call me and say, Glenn, I have one. Do you want to go see it? I say, when's it going to go live? She say, well, the bank wants me to list it on Thursday. And this would be like a Tuesday. And I'd say, okay. We would go out, look at the house right away. Yep. We'd get all of our numbers together. We'd have an offer written and prepared in her. I would say, "How? what do you think their bottom line is? And she'd say, pretty close to asking, but if you come in around here, I think you'll be okay. Then what she would do is the minute it hit the MLS, like eight o'clock that morning, she would present our offer to the bank. And there was a few banks that would only take one offer. If they liked your offer, they didn't want to get in negotiating. They just wanted to sell it and get out. Be done. Yep. The time was money. So they would go ahead and take the offer and, and boom. So that's how we got listings. And people say, how in the world did you guys get those listings? Relationships. That's relationships. Yeah. We, that's how we did it early on. And that's how we got pocket listings from the banks. Now, if our number didn't work, it still didn't work. Right. Because sometimes the bank wanted too much. They still had it, a bottom line. Yeah. We had to figure all that yeah. out. So so that was really important that we did. But I think that one of the things you, you mentioned relationships, I think we should talk about networking because that's really how we built our empire in the early days without spending a lot of money on marketing. Yeah, we we did. We took a lot of really, really grassroots approaches to finding deals because we didn't have the money at the time to to do the more advanced, you know, TV commercials and direct mail and, and all that. So we did. We networked with a lot of agents. We networked with mail carriers in different areas. Talk about the agents, though, because the agents, I think the, the agents are important to talk about because that, like you just said, getting getting both sides of the commission is advantageous to them. The seller gets a good deal for their house. So the house sells really quick, right? They, they're they happy with that process. We get a good deal in the process. It was really a win, win, win all the way around. And again, the agent will be able to get both sides of the commission. So that means they're going to push your offer a little more. Now, I know some people, some agents are probably listening now going, no, we'd never do that. Well, yeah, well, you do. I, I think it's a little different too if if an agent is working for a homeowner, because then, you know, you do want to make sure that there's, that you're getting as much as you possibly can by having it out there. But the banks really didn't care. The banks just wanted it off their books. Correct. But even with a homeowner, so an agent legally has to present any offer that you give yes. to their seller. Do they always do that? Probably not. But they're supposed to always present any offer. Now, they may present it and go, this is a piece of crap offer. Look at this. Right? They may not paint it with a pretty picture. Yeah. But again, if they're getting both sides of the commission, odds are they'll say, you can consider this. It's lower than I thought. Here's the pros. Here's the cons. What do you think? And let them decide. Right. And if they, yeah. if they if there's somebody who says, I just want to get out, if these guys can pay me cash and move on. Let's do it. So that was how we did that with with agents. But agents were a big one that we work with. And because we knew the people that wanted to sell a house, their first inclination is to call an agent. Right. That's their first inclination. Now, they, now this they is, think it's their only way. It's either a FISBO for sell by owner or yeah. to, to, to go through an agent. Like people don't really know that there's other options even out there. Well, I, think, I think they do now. And I want to I want to talk about I want to talk about the differences now as opposed to then, because back then there was no wholesaling going on. Right. That was not a thing. No. We we were the first ones in our area to really start wholesaling at any kind of a scale right. level. And, and again, wholesaling is when you put a house. Um, under contract for a certain price, then you sell that contract to another cash investor and you make what's called a spread on the difference. So if I put a house under contract for $150,000 in cash and I sell it to this other investor, John, over here for, for $170,000 in cash, I'll make $20,000 for selling that contract. And again, why would John want to buy the house for one seventy? dollars Because John ran his numbers and he can flip it and make fifty dollars Right. He's happy with that. 
You're a buyer and seller yeah. matchmaker of. Houses. And we have a whole episode. We can we will we'll uh, just check out our episodes. We have a whole episode on wholesaling and and how that all works. But anyway, we have to find those deals by networking. And so there weren't wholesalers back then. But who else do we network with? We networked with um, like the code enforcement, the the town yeah. code enforcement. You know, got, said, hey, yeah. let us know if you know of any houses. We we networked with remediators, whether that was like mold. I, or- I interrupt. Let's talk about the code enforcement because code enforcement technically is not really supposed to be involved yeah. in helping you for that. Now, can you deliver them bagels once in a while uh, on a you know Monday morning or a Friday morning and deliver to send a pizza over one yeah. day for and to say, guys, appreciate all the help you do because we do a lot of work in your area. And just build those relationships with them. We like making our town a better place and yes, improving, you know, I, improving the houses in your tax rolls. And- I remember because I was involved in the community and I was coaching Little League. One of the many things I don't do as a good father, right? When I was coaching Little League for my son for 20 years. <laughs> 20 years. <laughs> I, well, I'm still doing it now and I did it back then. So it's been a 20 year run over multiple children. Is that not true? Make yourself feel better. Oh my God. You are nasty today. <laughs> anyway. So apparently I do nothing as a father. I just sit around. I just, we have sex. I make babies and I that's did, it. That's all I do. say that, but. So I guess we're not having sex I like, tonight. I like that you put okay, words anyway, in my mouth. So um, anyway, so I remember though, the code enforcement guy when, because his son was a little league too. Mm-hmm. So I can remember conversations like, I'd say, hey, that's a vacant house over on, uh, you know, Vly Road. Have you seen that? Oh yeah. 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 What's up with that? I think the owners are this and this and this. Where are they? I think they live with their sister across town. Oh, really? And so that gave me some insight because I built that relationship. Yeah, it's like it's like the thing that the lawyers that you always say about lawyers. You know, there's there's legality and there's reality. Yeah. You know, there's what they should do and what they will do. Yeah. You know, and 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 it's relationships. You know, it's and then there's that other saying. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. You know, there there's there's gray areas in life where people can like word things a certain way and you know it it can be acceptable <laughs> all right let's take let's let's do a little detour here let's talk about code enforcement and our son oh gosh you want to talk about that we should talk about it. it's pretty funny i think he still works there i won't use names but there's a code enforcement officer in the town that, that we worked in i think he was number two in charge maybe he was number one in charge because the guy i knew finally retired our son was in high school gets into a battle with another sistering school. They, there's two schools in the one town. Yeah. And so they one were- One of his friends liked a girl from that yes, school. Yes, it was some something involved with girls and guys and, you know, the girl, whatever. And they decide to egg this kid's house. Yep. So they egg the house- And the car. And the car. And then our son had a man bun. I was so proud of that. He had a man bun at the time. He looked cute. He, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I liked his so long he, hair. He had his man bun. Kids got thick hair, but he he had a man bun, and they saw him at the local well, store. Yeah, the, there's a store. Stu- yes, they saw, and because the dumb kids after they egged the house, they left the carton on yes, the ground. Yes, they left like, the carton right there so, with the so name of where knew, they bought know, it. So the cops oh. came and knew that it was bought at Stewart's. Yes, and so they checked the camera of the, so the closest Stewart's. Get a phone call from the cops. We get on deal. I'm like, I'm like, you sure it's my son? They look. I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Yep, I, get a, unrec- I get a phone call. It's the code enforcement officer's kid. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so I get a phone. I had to call and ask. I asked, I said, listen, can you please? Because he wanted he wanted the kids to pay $2,000 to paint his, his door, door. Yeah. which was already 30 years old. He mm-hmm. wanted us to paint it. I said, my, I'll have my kids come paint it. Can we, can we settle with some restitution here? Because they're just being kids. It's just eggs. Can we do the right thing? I remember seeing a picture. Well, it was chipped here and chipped here. I'm like, looks like that's been chipped for 100 years, man. Come on. So. We talked about it, and and long story short, he did give my son a break. He did. And did not charge them the, the whatever it was, two thousand dollars. They had something, but we, we required Dakota to apologize. Oh yeah, yeah, all that. Yeah. And so all we did all that, but that's just kind of so. It was so funny because that guy's never been quite as good to us as code enforcement, right? <laughs> that was that was an odd. Oh, yeah, that, that was, was a little that was a little blemish. <laughs> oh, that one hurt a little bit. You know, they were kids. Oh, what are you gonna do? So. I think that he's still the code enforcement officer in that town too. So I think we still do a lot of business with him. Yeah. But just kind of ironic how that all happens. And then you remember what happened? He called me and yelled at me. Yeah. Because I he he had he had kind of released the charge, and like two days had gone by, and I hadn't called him and thanked him yet. I yeah. got busy, and I had on my list make sure you call and and thank him. And he called and said, "I can't believe it. I thought you were a man of integrity. You didn't call. You didn't say thank you. I'm really just I'm really just disappointed in you." And I'm like, "Oh my! This is a code enforcement officer yeah. of a place we've done." Hundreds of deals. Yep. And I'm like, 
I called him back. I said, hey, man, that's not true at all. I said, I just got caught up. I'm so sorry. So I was like, oh, man. Yeah, and you don't want your permits getting hung up because uh, – No. Of del- you know, delayed on purpose because yeah, then that so, cuts into your holding costs. And that's a whole other story. Yeah, but. so tip of the day is make sure that your kids, if they're going to egg a house, they don't egg the code enforcement officer's house. Probably not the best house to be no. egging. And they didn't know it was that. It no. just was ironic timing how that worked. But but as far as networking goes, like we, we always tell our students, get in front of people that are in front of the kind of houses you want to buy. So whether it's code enforcement, whether it's people that are doing remediation for Clean floods up, right. and fires and you know, clean outs, clean estate out. clean outs, or um, the dumpster companies, you know, those are people that are in front of the houses that you want to buy yeah. before you are. And they're, they're in front for their own reason. Right. Like uh, a, clean out, reason. a clean out person doesn't want to buy the house, but a clean right. out person, if you say to that person, Hey, listen, I'll give you $2,000. If you give me a lead that, that turns into a buy. Yeah. So if you give me a lead in a house and I go buy it and yeah, by make the way, it, make it worth their while. Oh yeah, give them, and people say two thousand dollars. Well, would you trade two thousand for fifty thousand? Right, I every hope day. So. I hope so. Every day, because that's what's going to cost you to go out and market to find a deal. So pay that person to go find the deal for you. And I think if you do that, that's that's how we built it, and that's what's that's what was been great for yeah. us. So from the from the eighties, starting out with a piece of paper in the MLS or the MLS book that we had till now, a lot of things have changed. Yeah. A lot of things have changed, yeah, right? Technology's the, changed. I mean, that's probably the number one thing that's changed. That Technology has, changed has advanced everything. so much. I mean, now when a when a deal goes on the MLS, every other Tom, Dick, and Harry knows about it. So your competition is insane. And good on the MLS, good deals last one day or less. Like an hour now. Yeah. It's, I mean, they're just it's crazy how yeah, it's just you know, information. But you it, could but you can do all your research online. Right. You can look up run the comps, comps online. You don't even have to be on the MLS or an agent, you, use an agent to run the comps. You can look up the pictures. You can look up old pictures. Yep. You can look up the, you can the, look up the history. You history can look up the, the history in the house. What, yes. what did the last Boom. owners buy it for? What did it sell? For, you know, like all the taxes and what school districts and what the rating of the school districts have and yeah. everything. You can do all that research right there, which you could not do before. It, no. took, it took forever to do it before. So technology was a big one. Competition. Yeah, there's a lot more competition. There's now. a lot. And I think it's because now people understand the secrets out, right? The, yeah. Now people know. How amazing real estate is. Yes. <laughs> what we've been saying, we've been thumping that drum for, for 20 years yeah. is that real estate is a, an amazing way to build wealth. Well, everybody's starting to get their hands on like, wow, okay, I understand that, but how do I do it? But it's causing, I tell you, one of the things that's, that's causing, I think that, you know, a lot of the newbie investors right now are ruining and spoiling deals. Some of the new people that don't know what they're doing, they kind of, they're like jackasses out there. They just kind of, hee haw. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know. That was an interesting sound, honey. <laughs> they don't know. I'm going to try that later. No, so, please don't. So not that they, it would help you anyway. They, yeah, I, I'm aware of this evening. So let's not, let's move away from the me not having any action for a week after that argument conversation. So <laughs> I love your face. People that are, are just listening, they can see your face now. I'm pretty much terrified. Okay, here we go. So the newbies, I think they come in, they don't know what they're doing. They they offer too much on the house or they try and lock down a deal as a wholesale, not cheap enough, so they can't sell it. Then they end up pissing off the the home owner yeah. or the seller and they get they get the home seller thinking their home is worth more than it actually is because they can't sell it. So now they, they screw them up. They don't say the right things. And so there's all these people that are trying to be. Well, and then it kind of tarnishes our industry name too. It does. Like people that are, are good at their craft and, and do this well yeah. and take care of everybody and make it a win-win. It has, the, what, what's new now, and we, we touched on this before, is the rise of the wholesaler. Mm-hmm. Now suddenly there are wholesalers. Again, we talked about what that was earlier. There's wholesalers in the market that are taking deals away from real estate agents Lock them down under contract, then selling that contract. Now, in some states, that's been outlawed. Yeah, I think Oklahoma is yeah, one of them. Now, so. now let's let's describe what's been outlawed. And this is a, we can we'll, we'll dive down this. We might want to dive deeper in a different episode. But there is there is what's called a double close, and there's what's called a assignment of contract. So an assignment of contract means that I never actually own the house. So I buy a house for a hundred thousand dollars for argument's sake. I sell it to you for $110,000. I make $10,000 net. All I'm doing is giving you that piece of paper and you're essentially paying me an assignment fee so I can assign that contract to you. I never take ownership of that document. That is illegal in a couple of states. I know Oklahoma for sure. And I know they're trying to ban it because I'm sure agents don't like the fact that people are coming there without a license and mm-hmm. are, are doing it. Now, in those states, I, I believe, don't hold me to this, but if you are licensed in those states, 
if you're licensed in those states, you still can do wholesaling, but you have to be licensed as a real estate agent to be able to do wholesaling in those states. Now, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that even though there is a lot of competition and that is something that's changed because people are recognizing what an amazing vehicle that uh, real estate investing is, I don't think that should scare people off because competition is no. never a bad thing. Um, does it make deals a little more challenging to find if you if you don't know how to find the off market deals? Yes. Yeah. Um, but you know, you and I still to this day, when we have for the last many years, have an education company where we teach people how to do it, and we even do it in the capital region area. Probably a, a good percentage of our students are from that area. The one thing that people have always said is, "Why are you teaching people how to do it in your backyard?" And it's because we have a, an abundance mindset, not a scarcity mindset. Yeah. And even though there's a lot of competition, there's a lot of houses yeah. that are still going to need, you know, and the, the 10 D's that we go over of, of motivated sellers, that's always going to happen in our lifetime. Yeah. That's never going to stop. So yes, there's a lot of competition, but there's plenty of houses to go around to. Yeah. I want to finish my other thought because I, I didn't finish it and I started that and I want to finish it, that there's a sign of contract. Then there is a, what's you're called still a, talking about that? a double like close. Done. Well, I think the people want to hear it. I started a sentence. You completely interrupted me, which well, is wonderful because we have a wonderful dynamic happening today. It's just going to be a wonderful weekend. I feel it coming. So I, I'm the double close is when I say, okay, I'm going to um, do the same thing, but I'm actually going to buy this property and then sell it to you within five minutes. And I'm going to use the end buyer's money to do it. So a little more complicated, but that's, that goes over. We go over that in more detail. So. There are two different kinds of closings. The double closing is, is still legal in all states. You can't, you can't let people not double close. So that can happen. So to buy it and sell it. Buy it and sell it. Okay. That's a lot of the differences we've had since we started in the industry. Things have changed a lot. Things have changed a ton since back in the, uh, in the Gen X time. Can you still make money in the MLS? You can. Harder. I think you have to have a different strategy. For example, you know, there are people that go after like expired listings and that, right. that, but like, if you're just looking for the hot <clears throat> deal that's popping up that says, you know, Hey, this is a fixer upper or a handyman yep. special. Those deals go like hotcakes. You know, sometimes if, if a deal has something really wrong with it, if there's a major foundation issue or something like that, that not everybody wants to tackle that deal might sit for a while and we call it being tenderized. The, right. the owner gets tenderized realizing, Hey, I'm never going to get what I thought I was going to get when I put this on the market. Yeah. And then, you know, six months from now, like when the listing expires, then they might be more open to a lower offer. Yeah. It's always about, yeah, we, we, we've used that. We've used that term for 20 years. My dad was a butcher, right? So we always use that term tenderized. Once somebody's tenderized, that means they're, they loosened up and they're saying, yeah, I'm, it could be because they're, they have problems with their house or it could be, it usually comes up to a number. Yeah. There's a number that they weren't willing to take, like you said, and now they're kind of over time, they're getting like, okay, okay, okay. And away they go. So yeah. let's, let me just at a very high level, um, I believe the only way to be really successful is to find off market deals. Yep. We preach that all the time at Vestor Pro, our education company. Agreed. And it's, you know, we have multiple D's of these and, and let's, let's just, we're not going to dive into them today just because of time, but we're going to do a, let's, let's do like a three part series and let's dive in each one of these and kind of help people understand what they are. Is that cool? Yeah. yeah. That'll work for you. Oh, sure. Correct me now if you'd like to three, four part series, whatever it might be, there'll be a multiple part series that we do with this. We'll consider this, Series one, right? Yes. So this will be the first one, the first episode of that. But we Hopefully have Hopefully the other ones won't start with a fight. Yeah, pray to God that doesn't happen. Although listeners might like that. So who knows? So, all right, here we go. The, the D's of motivated sellers. And again, a motivated seller is someone that has to sell their house for a certain reason. They've gotten themselves in a situation because of a life decision or because life has happened to them. Life circumstance, yeah. Right? So they've gotten themselves in a situation. So the first one is always death. Right. Right. People die and there's usually a, a piece of property that has to be dealt with. Right. Um, then there's disease. People get sick yep. and they've got to, they have to move out of the house. They have to go to a different location. They have to, or they, they or that leads to death. Right. Or they have to move to assisted living. That kind of, that kind of thing can happen too. Disease might just be getting older. Divorce, which maybe I'm in trouble for today after that conversation earlier. So divorce, <laughs> divorce makes people of course want to be away from each other as quickly as humanly possible in many cases. And also liquidated piece of property. By the way, you're, you're stuck with me for life. So I'm not going anyplace. I'm aware. So I'm painfully aware today. <laughs> you're just a real sweetheart. All right. You want, you want to do some of these or let me just keep talking. Yeah. So then there's dilapidated. So if a house is dilapidated, you know, it's falling apart and maybe somebody either doesn't want to, or doesn't have the, 
the funds to fix the house. Um, there's destination. So sometimes people have to move for one reason or another. Maybe they've gotten a job in a different city or town. Maybe they have to uh, move to a different town to, to take care of a family member or something like that. There's people that get downsized or they want to downsize their house. So that could be that they're downsized in their job so they can't afford their house anymore. Yeah. Or they just want to, you know, maybe they're an empty nester and they want to downsize the size of their house because they don't want that much to take care of. Yep. Um, there's people that just get disgusted with their with their current situation and they just want out. They just want to be able to close the chapter and move on. They're just disgusted for a number of reasons. Yeah. Um, there's disaster that could be a natural disaster, a hurricane, a flood, a, a, a tornado, like a, a fire, anything. Then there's yep. other disasters that could happen. You know, your house could... Your tub could overflow and right, you could have water, you know, could have mold, could have right. fire, you could have settling, you could right. have a lot of disasters that happen right in your own home. Yep. Exactly. Or your wife stabs you while you're sleeping. That could happen too. As <laughs> if. Um, there's people that, you know, get delinquent either on taxes or on their mortgage. That's obviously a big problem. And then there's houses that just are deserted. Yeah. They're just people just are like, All right, I'm done. I'm done. I'm just gonna leave. We yeah. we have that happen with boats in our area. Yes. People they leave. leave boats in the in the uh, Boca Ciego. Yep. Right in Tampa Bay area. They take off the registration and say, Screw it. You can because deal it's, with it. It's cheaper to abandon the boat than yep. it is to dispose of it. Yes. So people do the same thing with houses. Well, I'll tell you what, we are gonna we're gonna do three more parts of this series and we're gonna dive into each one of these in detail in detail and we're also going to talk about how to stack motivators because when you stack motivators you have a much more motivated seller so i think if we could teach people how to stack teach people how to do that uh, hopefully they'll enjoy us so we'll do a little gen x thing we do all the time and we'll uh, we'll lead off with that and then we'll hopefully not fight and, and give not only will we go into a, a deeper dive on what each of these are but also how do you find these people That's we'll do important. that for everyone so so Keep tuning in and uh, we'll see you on the next episode during this series of how to find off-market deals and how to be a rockstar real estate investor. That concludes this episode of the Fearless Future podcast. Make sure you click that like button. And, <laughs> and if you want to hear more, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and make hit that notification button so you don't miss anything. 